Hello, hi everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Ryan. This is Tio, and we're going to be talking about uh, serving ML models uh, for search in an e-commerce context. If you've already done this, we hope that this can be a kind of a way to uh, compare notes and maybe feel a little bit better about your own system. And if you haven't done it, it'll maybe give you an example of uh, how we can serve models with very strict latency requirements. Uh, so let's go to the contents. So this is we're going to talk about first kind of uh, lay the groundwork and show uh, introduction to Mercari, and then we'll talk about the problems that we had uh, serving ML models, and then how we iterated on the solution, and then final finally uh, what we're looking to do next and some conclusions. Uh, so about Mercari, uh, we're Japan's largest C2C e-commerce platform. Uh, we were launched in 2013. We have um, GMV of 880 billion yen and net sales of about 150 billion yen. Um, and the majority of our sales come from search. So search is really big at Mercari, yeah. really important part of our business. Uh, so we have 20 million monthly uh, active users. And to put that in context, that means about one in six people in Japan are accessing our site every month. Uh, we have um, tens of millions, uh, 20 million monthly active users, hundreds of millions of items in our catalog, and we get thousands of queries per second. Uh, so this is kind of a, a very uh, simplest, simplified diagram of our uh, topology, our search architecture. And um, one thing you can say, see here is it wasn't designed for ML. Mm. Uh, so this, our company was founded 10 years ago, and we've worked a long time uh, optimizing the case of getting results from Elasticsearch very quickly and returning them to the user. And no, no consideration was given to how we would serve an ML model in this context. Our data as well, the way we log data and store data was not uh, designed with machine learning in mind at all. So how we would train a model, how we would evaluate a model, all had difficulties, which Tio is going to talk about later. And I mentioned before that uh, search is a really big part of our business. So when we decided to put ML into our search, we had to do it very carefully because uh, any uh, degradation of our search performance would cost us a lot of money. So uh, that was one thing we had to keep in mind the whole time. Uh, and now we'll talk about the problems that we had. And for the rest of the talk, I'll pass over to Tio. Tio, please go ahead. Awesome. Thanks, Ryan. And so um, I think Ryan did a really great job actually of articulating kind of the main business problem that we had. And we wanted to emphasize, too, that even though there wasn't really ML in this system yet, it was still really effective, right? And so this was in 2013. And at the same time, it's from 2013, right? So the system is just a little bit older, and its capabilities could be better. And so I kind of don't need to go over the gist of the slide. I think we can all get it at this point. And so, you know, say Buzzwords itself, it's been going on since 2010. And I think the first AI ML talks, um, if I recall correctly, were about 2012. And then you know, fast forward 10 years, it's 2030 or 2023. And so it's almost like AI in search isn't this research question anymore. It's not a question really of should we. It's really how can we and why haven't we done so yet. Um, well, I mean, again, 2013. AI in search was a novel idea, right? It had a lot of rough edges. We couldn't do what we do now of just, you know, pip installing a library, um, fine tuning some pre trained model, and just deploying in some model server that's, you know, with a very mature framework. That wasn't really our reality at the time. And at the same time, again, back to 2023, at Mercari Search is the vehicle that brings our users and sellers together in our online marketplace. And so, it has the tech from 2013, very battle-tested, has um, scaled for all the way from you know, the few handful of users we had to our 20 million monthly active users, right? It just wasn't tailor-made, as Ryan said, for search, or for AI in that search. And so, at the same time, 10 years later, there are many capabilities users have really come to expect from especially e-commerce search, right? And so, now, the, the challenge was really, how can we deliver this to our users? What do we need to do to kind of up to the next level our search system to add that extra value? And so, again, this is what we had at the time, as Ryan mentioned already. When we first started, um, our search was purely Elasticsearch based, with years of, at best, basic hand tuning of ES parameters, and there's some like, rules based filtering of the search results in the application logic. And um, other than that, that was kind of stock Elasticsearch. And at the same time, 
again, business critical part, um, one of the most high traffic parts of our application. So about like tens of thousands of QPS per second peak, right? And so not amenable to extreme risky change. We couldn't just wipe the slate clean and then move to something else um, that was an Elasticsearch with AI built into its uh, architecture. On top of that, because of the scale that we're at, we had just a very minimal latency budget. So on the order of tens of milliseconds. And um, that was kind of the high level challenge that we had to face. And also, I kind of want to take a second to mention that uh, in addition to this, we also had Kubernetes, right? And so this whole thing after the client was deployed in Kubernetes, but for the sake of the conversation, we're not going to talk about that at all for the most part. Um, just to say that it's a lot more complicated than this, and we're abstracting away all of that just for the sake of the discussion. So um, there was a lot more, but we will get to that maybe in a Q&A if necessary. And so in addition to the kind of technical constraints, there were these business constraints, right? Um, so improvements needed to be kind of well-scoped with frequent deliverables, and then always at every step lead to up and to the right user satisfaction. And so because of that, all of these constraints, technical and business, um, we had lots of careful planning and negotiation to develop our first entry point, which is this learning to rank, right? This is probably very, um, it's not new to anybody here, but at the same time, it was new to us and it would give us a foothold to actually establishing AI in our search system. So um, for those aren't, who aren't familiar here, it's kind of, you can think of it as a multi-phase retrieval paradigm. So stage one is Elasticsearch, what we had already, and stage two is just re-ranking those search results with some kind of AI model, right? And so the benefit of this is we could really work within the existing system without kind of supplanting it, right, and just replacing it all together. And we can do so because, again, and this isn't new, right, with some industry-proven techniques, and nothing cutting edge, but just enough to really gain us ground on this problem. And maybe a relevant side note, um, this is actually, we use a kind of a pseudo-hybrid search. So our model eventually actually used Elasticsearch rank itself as a feature. So this wasn't kind of a neatly decoupled uh, retrieval paradigm, but just potentially useful for people in the audience to know. And so now maybe the burning question is kind of what happened? And also really, how does MLOps really play into this, right? So let's start with the what, the why, and the how. So the what, what is MLOps and why should we care? Um, a really simple way of looking at it is maybe just uh, DevOps for ML, right? I mean, it's just the, the dev is silent. And so basically there's this definition that I took from this paper by Shankar et al, um, operationalizing machine learning. It's basically, if you can uh, accept my hand wavy definition, the, the set of things that we need to do to get a model into production, the things that we do kind of consistently over time. And so it begs the question, well, OK, right, you just told me that MLOps is just DevOps for ML. So why does it need to be a separate thing? Why can't we just say DevOps and then some ML constraints? And I would conjecture it's because deploying ML software is kind of it's a little hard, right? Maybe very hard. Um, definitely much harder than the same software if you didn't have ML at all. And it's not just harder, it's really different different in a lot of ways where you couldn't just scale up the existing DevOps practices that you have for software for now ML software. Um, and it's actually not really quite obvious at first, so some people kind of hand wave this in a way and say, why not? Um, but uh, for the people really at the ground level building this system, that's when you kind of realize, oh, you no, know, these things are obvious to us now, right? We do need something that's a little more catered to ML applications directly. And so uh, with that said, maybe I've convinced you right, after just one slide, that MLOps is necessary for ML, right? Let's just pretend I've convinced you already. Um, so I can also hand wave and say that means that we took some MLOps best practices, which summarizing it up, simplifying it, is to just get lots of data, throw it in a big pot of statistics and compute, and just serve it to our customers. And then that's it. That was the success story. We were done. Um, right? Can I, can I end the talk here? Is that fine? <laughs> is everyone happy with that? No? Maybe? maybe? Can I get at least one no, so I can go on? No. OK. So <laughs> why is no one happy with this takeaway? Um, maybe it's because it's not really useful, right? Uh, maybe it's because that there's enough variance between use cases that I can't just say, oh, yeah, just do the thing. You'll figure it out. Um, maybe you know, change a few variables here and there. No, it's not quite like that. Um, there isn't a one-size-fits-all solution. And then you know, even talking about raw data, things like this, it's, my data may be very different from yours. Use case may be very different from yours. Customers may be very different from yours. And then this might say, for instance, for the rest of the discussion when we talk about ML uh, model serving, that might require different serving techniques and different things that we should serve our customers. And so also kind of, I should say, uh, catalyzed, right, or not uh, modulated by 
how many models we're serving at any given time and kind of what the cadence is of that release cycle. And so, fret not, right? I've just told you that, okay, ML, ML is very different. We need ML ops. Everything is, uh, you know, there's no one size fits all solution. But I think that's not quite because there aren't solutions, but just that we haven't found all of them. And there are some unifying solutions. So now, if we kind of move up a level of, of abstraction, there are some common patterns and themes that you will see throughout different ML applications that we were seeing ourselves that we will talk about later on in the talk. And maybe, I'm hoping that's, guess, I'm guessing that's why you're here today. As Ryan said, our goal is maybe if you haven't done this already, you'll have some pointers. If you've done this already, um, you'll find some kind of, you'll have some empathy with us. And maybe if you've done it already, at the Q&A section, you can tell us what we're doing is completely insane, right? And stop us from doing something kind of even more insane. But the point is, is we're all figuring out together. Um, the field is still very new. And so um, that's what our goal is for this talk, is kind of to interchange ideas. And then talking about the how. So how we did this, we didn't start by training the most bleeding edge, deep learning, LLM, AI, XYZ model. Uh, but what we did do is just kind of focus on the software, right? The AI is just kind of something that was tertiary to our goal. So feature first, software second, and then AI third. And making sure this was kind of a key point for us is to focus on making ML application development amenable to standard DevOps practices that are well-worn, right? There's no reason that it needs to be completely different. There are things we can do to move it a little to the left. Um, and then one thing we didn't do is we didn't go all in on a major platform from day one. But what we did do is we did build these platforms and processes iteratively on top of some concrete use cases. Um, again, LTR, right? And systems emerged really naturally as solutions to real problems that we faced. Um, and then we also never gave in to the uh, temptation to over-engineer anything, right? We made sure that once we had a bottleneck, we solved it, and we moved on to the next one. And then what we didn't do is we didn't build in a silo on the first set of requirements. What we did do is we did regularly look across the company to see you know, what everyone else was working on to keep our work aligned and to reorient as needed, right? Also, at the same time, getting help from other teams and helping as needed. And then finally, what we didn't do is we didn't fly blind and say, OK, this is what Twitter did, this is what Google did, this is what Facebook did, right? Um, but what we did want to do is good, get good feedback cycles early on. So for the feature, that just meant business, and operational met or business metrics and A-B tests, operationally, logs and metrics, and AI models, just kind of classic quantitative, qualitative um, kind of measures like NDCG for LTR. And then um, you know, cherry-picked examples, consensus among the team of some golden set of um, search results. And then one final thing to mention that isn't, I guess, kind of a how was um, just want to emphasize that hardening a system for production use is really non-trivial. So really, it is important to budget enough uh, expertise and headcount accordingly. So some people thought that LTR project would take one quarter and we'd be done. Um, it's been a little more than one quarter, and we're still working on it. And I think that just goes to show that there's a lot of complexity in what we're doing. And then as Ryan said, kind of the spoiler is just this talk won't be this, uh, about a big framework that we're open sourcing or something like uh, monumental that we did. Actually, it's a lot about a lot of small things that we did to get one ML model into production and then to get multiple models into production and now to build something that the rest of the company can use, right? And as I mentioned earlier, that was really kind of based on starting from first principles, use case driven platform and then growing from there. And so if you come away with one takeaway from this talk, we're hoping it's that you know, if you're trying to do this, whatever scale you're at, you don't need really complicated um, investments, engineering investments to do production ML at scale. You don't need big ML ops platforms, the Gartner like, technology landscape of the day. You don't need to adopt all those tools. You can start small, go from there, see what you really need. Um, but at some point, you may need something, you know, more batteries included, which we did eventually. We'll get into that later. But start small, start simple, and then I think that'll take you a long way. And so, um, diving into the details of how, right, of this whole system that, as Ryan alluded to, we put into production and that gave us the inspiration to build an actual platform. So we're going to start with a very quick overview of our data pipelines for LTR, um, the evolution of our model serving setup, and then we're going to conclude with what we plan to um, primarily focus on going forward. So, oh yeah, no, sorry, I've got two more slides, um, actually. <laughs> um, so going back to the... Uh, was the judicious resource allocation that had to do actually with, um, again, uh, budgeting time accordingly and then starting small but soon. So um, now back to the main topic, uh, data pipelines. So for some motivating context, our pipelines are, well, they're written in SQL because our data warehouse is GCP BigQuery. And so 
we started small. We started with the most basic SQL queries. And fortunately, though, it kind of uh, ballooned in complexity and redundancy, which made this a kind of an early and uh, painful bottleneck. And so uh, a lot went into really resolving this. And I think the main thing for us was moving to DBT to orchestrate these queries. So again, we started simple, but at some point we needed a tool that could make development scalable. And the main, um, like the value add from this wasn't just kind of automating and scaling what we were doing, but it was actually, again, best practices, right? Now we can move these kind of uh, SQL queries that were written in Confluence, right, into version control for things like, you know, I don't know, code review, right? Uh, for kind of knowledge sharing, for better like maintainability, coupling with the ap actual application code that used this data. And so um, we could treat data code like application code, right? Apply traditional best practices to them. And then that reduced complexity. Uh, Sort of. Um, but it did actually, again, uh, unblock that development velocity that we had at the time, that friction that we were having. Uh, but now we had things like these weird action at a distance bugs. So something all the way in the left, some little change, maybe a schema change or some feature that we thought we were going to add, just propagated all the way to the end. And now we have some empty tables for you know, who knows what reason, right? Um, on top of that, it was confusing and redundant um, because of these same data engineers were saying, oh, OK, these SQL queries that we've written, now we can just write them here. Let's copy and paste this one, put it over here, add a new where conditional, and then that's it. It's a new SQL query, right? Um, so now we had this uh, even more proliferation of these kind of crazy queries going on. So it was still painful, uh, less than before, but still kind of painful. And I think the key point at this stage was introducing data engineering best practices. So. Um, right? It was a crazy idea, but at the same time, that, that was the reality. That's what we did, and that's what got us to the next stage. And so we'd really implore you, um, if you can, right, at the same time as moving to this DBT stage, try to enforce that early on to prevent kind of getting this spaghetti of code, right? This, this really long data pipeline. Um, and so that was key to this next transition, which is now we were really proud to call real data pipelines, right? And so um, we were really lucky that we had a seasoned data engineer join our team, uh, Tako Makinoshita, and he was able to enforce a really strong data model on the pipeline uh, to improve like, the performance, efficiency, and just maintainability, understandability, right? So it's still a little painful, but really relative to two slides ago, this was kind of you know, amazing. This really unblocked both development velocity and release velocity and got us to where we needed to go in a way that we think we can actually maintain. And so uh, with data pipelines out of the way, we can talk about the ML model serving component of our system. And so this is where we started. So this is the same exact graph that we saw earlier, except that now what we did is we inserted the model directly in the backend search server. Um, can anyone think of a problem with this? No? No. Well, I can tell you one. So, um, <laughs> The, well, I'll start with a good thing. It was actually simple, and it was the right thing to do. We could release right away. Uh, and it started off as a general feature improvement, right? So if you think of ML as just an implementation detail, it makes sense, right? It's just a feature. Um, and at the same time, the engineers in charge of this were very um, well-versed in the back-end search server, so they could do these things. They can just hack around and insert this as just a, a typical function call. Um, but this wasn't really scalable in the long run. So for instance, uh, we have more contemporary approaches that we wanted to try. There are a few Go libraries, and like, not many of them are very mature. And there are really few ML engineers happy to write Go native ML models. And even for this, it really wasn't maintainable. So in this case, there was a, concretely an implementation detail. We had the model weights in a raw text file parsed on startup, which you know, had some surface area for bugs that did come out every so often, and we knew that we needed to move away from this paradigm sooner than later. And additionally, there is this very tight coupling, because now if this is just a feature within this backend search server, you can imagine a really huge code base with uh, dozens of teams of engineers working on this code base, frequent release cycles, but we couldn't actually frequently release this feature, updates to this model, right? And as a lot of people know here probably, that ML is actually really experimental in nature. And so you really need fast and frequent iterations to deliver effectively, right? This lack of speed really kills ML features just dead in the water. And so the next step, which seemed obvious at the time, OK, let's just decouple the search system, right? So we just took it out of the search server and just put it into a separate microservice. That was it. Um, problem solved, kind of. Um, and the way we did that was instead of now being a function call in the backend search server, it's just an RPC with a timeout on top. Um, and that met our latency requirements we mentioned earlier. And I think actually the really important point that we noted here was that because of this timeout, 
we could make sure that search results would always be returned in the worst case in their original Elasticsearch rank order. And so now we can make the business argument that no matter what we did, um, we always had this escape hatch to make the search results strictly as good, if not better, than they were before. So that helped us to really make sure that we were delivering that you know, up and to the right search experience for our users. And then, again, this decoupling did help solve the iteration issue that we mentioned earlier, the faster dev cycles. Now we could iterate, um, release as needed, keep the interface the same. And now we had the flexibility to choose the right tool for the right job. So um, we didn't mention earlier, a lot of these systems are written in Go upstream, right? And so not just the search server, it's search adapter, feature flags, things like this. And um, now we could just choose whatever language we wanted, which means also whatever framework we wanted. So we moved to a small deep neural network as our ML model. Then we used TF ranking. Then we used PyTorch. Easy. Um, the actual backend search server was very agnostic to all of this and just worked, right? Um, and then operational metrics actually became really easy. And so now, because this was a separate microservice, we're running in Kubernetes, we just set this magical environment variable depending on what model we're serving at the time. And now this variant would just kind of appear in all of our operational dashboards. And then the final thing that's worth noting that is not on this slide because it's a bit of a dirty secret, but maybe is useful for everybody here, was that we packaged the trained model artifact within the container image of this uh, model server that we have out here. And so, um, if nobody has any problems with that, does anybody have problems with that, maybe? Setting you guys up to say no again. Yes or no? No problems? Yes problems? OK. Yes. yes. Thank you. <laughs> ah, this gentleman I've never met before. Thank you so much. Um, so yes, the problem with this is that sometimes there's another paradigm where you download a model on startup. If you're packaging this like, gigantic ML model in your container images every time you build one, that's a lot of bloat that's unnecessary. Maybe, but there are a lot of upsides to this, right? And so we conjecture that there are fewer and uh, hardened points of failure, right? Now, instead of a separate service to download this model, it's just your container registry. That's it. Fewer components to manage, which means smaller surface area for mistakes. And now, because of that, because now it's just all in the container, scale up within Kubernetes became really easy, right? So now just your bottleneck is your first image pull. After that, if you have proper caching in your node, scaling up is just as simple as scaling up any other service. And uh, the hidden benefit is this actually inherently coupled the ML model to application code, which sounds terrible, but actually is really helpful to avoid some classes of training serving SKU because of the fact that we have to, um, we have to update them in tandem. And so um, we think that for the downsides of bigger images, we had a lot of upsides that helped us to kind of move forward more reliably. And the next stage is because now we can iterate really quickly, now we tried some more interesting features, which ended up working, having a huge impact. But now it necessitated this really complicated feature store component. Um, well, it, thankfully, because we started simple, it wasn't too bad. So again, we used BigQuery for data pipelines. That became our offline feature store by default. Uh, then we moved to GCP Bigtable for online feature store. A little too slow, so we introduced uh, memory store Redis as a cache on top, and a little better. Um, we eventually promoted that to the primary backing store after adding ETLs to directly populate that Redis instance. And that was really the key to moving past this stage. Now we could serve with really low latency. And so, um, again, I mentioned before we had timeouts on these re-ranking requests. So in the worst case, um, not a bad search experience, just you get what you got before. And so at the time, before all of this feature store stuff was happening, we were averaging about 60% skips um, while only serving half of our production traffic. So this was during like an A-B test. So now at the very end, when we have this direct ETL memory store Redis, now we have 25% skips on average, well, I should say at peak, um, and that's actually serving all of our production traffic. And so that really was the way for us to move forward at this stage, starting simple, adding components on top, and then now we can just promote them, again, to the kind of the next level of the feature store. Um, and at the same time, using the same techniques as before. So we have timeouts and fallbacks in each new component of this feature store. So if um, memory store Redis was down, then we can just fall back to big table. You'd skip a little more, but you'd still have something there. And if that failed, you'd fall back again. And then, you know, in the worst case, 100% Elasticsearch. And so at the very least, we, we were able to introduce just graceful degradation at each step of development. So now, um, I'm going to claim to you that our serving bottlenecks were all done. We were serving 100% production traffic, uh, very low latency, problem solved, except for the fact that now the business says, oh, OK, cool, do it again. Let's do more features. Let's try something else out. So now, A-B test setup. 
that became our big um, kind of bottleneck going forward, really the biggest pain point that we had at this stage. And I think for the past year, I want to say, right? <laughs> And so, um, essentially, each A-B test meant setting up a completely new microservice out here, setting up all these new routing rules and a lot of manual work across repos for all of these components um, pictured here and more. And for um, demonstration, these are just the PRs to a single repo to tear down an A-B test, right? So there are at least this many more to spin up the A-B test, and maybe a dozen more across all the other repos to get this working. And that's hoping that you've done everything right, that there wasn't a bug that you've introduced somewhere with a lot of this repeated work, right? And this is something today that we're solving via actually Selden and Istio. So as I mentioned, we're starting small, going from there. This is the going from there part. This is where we really needed to scale up our development speed. And this is something that Ilden with, or Selden with at least Istio routing is giving us. And so now we can build more time releasing features instead of just testing those features. And so Selden is just like a feature-rich, batteries-included model serving framework, um, optimized for high-performance serving. So our latency is as good, if not better, than it was before. It has strong Kubernetes support, which is easy enough to plug and play, and it was really a perfect fit for our top-down integration strategy. And then the way Istio plays into this is you just have this uh, thing called an ingress gateway, which gives you opportunities for fine-grained traffic routing. And then the, this was the biggest win, right? A huge simplification for setting up new deployments, which looks essentially just like this. Um, one PR with, after you get some boilerplate out of the way, just 20 lines of code, something like this, maybe, which we're conservatively saying is about a 70% reduction in manual effort to set up A-B tests. And um, I don't have any quantitative data, but I can tell you, like, just from anecdotally, uh, from the engineers involved with setting this up before, um, they're a lot happier now. They have a lot more time to do a lot more interesting work. Like, I don't know, um, going to Germany to present at a conference and meet a bunch of cool people, learn a few things, and bring it back to the team. So um, maybe that's not on the A-B test dashboard, but, you know, N equals one. I can tell you that that was an outcome. And then the other big win that we're actually getting from Selden that we didn't have before was shadow traffic. So this was uh, literally impossible with our current setup before. But now we can do things like, I'm going to call test and prod, because it sounds very uh, provocative, right? So now we can do something. So remember those latency timeouts I mentioned earlier? We're still at 25% um, average. In this case, I, can, I guess I lied to you, 32% at peak, 25 at average. And so um, with shadow traffic, in a single day, we we're able to validate some infra and model optimizations that we knew were going to work. Well, we hypothesized were going to work, right? But we had no way to test it outside of an A-B test. We tested it in a day, offline, it works. And we dropped the skips from 32% to a little over 12% at peak. And that, was, that saved the company, well, I should say they made the company a lot more money. And that was a very high ROI, right? So um, nothing else we could have done to actually um, improve the metrics better than this. And that's what you got from Selden out of the box and took us just one day. And then next, what we really want to do is that we're hoping to explore uh, traffic stratification. So now we can say general models can serve some segments of traffic. And if we have uh, really tricky or valuable segments, then we can have some segment of vertical specific models, right? So for fashion or maybe even platform, things like this. Um, we're not there yet, but you know, in the future, that's, that's the plan for model serving. And with that being said, the future is more than just model serving. And so now we want to get into things um, well, I'm going to kind of spoil it again, but we want to get into monitoring a little more, right? Model monitoring. So now it's not enough to just deploy these models out there, serve them, and having them serve production traffic forever. Um, maybe an ML model isn't like any other feature. Maybe that's what makes it different as well, as you can't just leave it there forever and have it perform the same. And so right now, if we wanted to model, monitor model performance, um, the only way we do that is uh, business metrics, <laughs> which unfortunately is a trailing indicator. So if a business metric tells you the model is bad, that means we've already lost money de by definition. So now what we really want is we want a leading indicator, something we can catch ahead of time. And we can say, OK, we need to retrain this model to prevent us from losing mo uh, money. And again, this comes directly out of the box um, in Selden with something called Alibi Detect. And so in addition to ad liar and adversarial uh, detection, it also has drift detection. And this is where I think that Selden is really going to pay off for us. And broadly, a drift is just when inputs or outputs begin to differ to the, from what the model was trained on. So for instance, time seasonality, right? The model is trained in winter. Now it's running all up until summer. Um, 
a lot of the items it's going to see and a lot of the interactions it's going to see are very different from when it was trained on in December, right? And also out of distribution input, um, new brands hit the market, new trends happen, new articles of clothing or electronics. Um, the model had never seen that before, and so we would presume that it would perform very poorly. Um, again, we don't need to presume anymore. Now we have something that can tell us. We have a tool that can monitor that over time and say, okay, well, potentially we need to retrain this model. And uh, now we have a pretty graph for the PMs to look at to say, oh yeah, you're right. We want to do this and we don't want to lose money. You're right, you're right. Um, and so again, this is where we think that um, after model serving, Selden is really going to pay off for us. And so in conclusion, uh, there's no big surprise to anyone here, I hope, AI in search can make uh, search better for both the users and the business. Um, and I think the big takeaway is gradually integrating little by little. It works great, and I think uh, maybe it might be the only way to go at scale, right? Um, we don't all have the luxury of wiping the slate clean and then for you know, uh, only two customers to be affected or something. Um, so I think building MVPs in response to real concrete use cases also can deliver the biggest and broader long-term impact than building this gigantic platform from day one. And so little by little, and also at the same time, we realized, wait a minute, because of the fact that we're solving actual problems, other teams have these same problems, again, unifying themes across applications, across teams. Um, now, instead of um, some teams which have tried to go top down and say, we're going to build a platform for everybody, it serves nobody, now we build a platform just for us that's serving everybody, right? So um, that actually worked out really well for us. And then uh, really importantly, these trade-offs, so again, sticking your head up from your silo every so often to look across the org to help out, but also to get help and to make sure that what you're like, adding to this system lines up with where the business is going. And so Ryan and I had a really fun talk yesterday of how a lot of business people at this point think ML is snake oil. And it's like, no, it's not snake oil. There's a lot there, but I understand that you know, there's this over-promising, right, under-delivering. And at the same time, you can't just go too minimal forever. This A-B test pain that we've had for a year, if we would have taken um, a quarter, maybe even less, right, to add Selden, we would have been way farther out than we are now. And so I think there's this mix of starting simple, but now um, keep selling people fish oil with their multivitamins, something that like, takes a long time to pay off, but needs to be done now because it'll never pay off, right? If you just do the simplest thing forever, you end up in a rut. And on that note, um, the one issue with the simple, like little by little integration, kind of to watch out for, um, technical compromise versus technical debt, right? Technical compromise we do on purpose, uh, and that's something that we take on and we say we're going to plan for that in the future. Technical debt, not always. A lot of that sometimes is kind of um, just uh, unintentionally negligent, and so we want to make sure that everybody just that that's our um, our advice to everybody here is because this little by little approach, um, this debt of any kind will compound astronomically. So to make sure that you kind of focus on um, best practices first and doing things as well as you can in the beginning. And uh, I guess semi lastly, a quote that I really like from the great John Maxwell, um, one is too small a number to achieve greatness. So I just want to give a quick shout out to all of the teams that helped us. Mercari has a very strong teamwork culture. And it really it wasn't just us. There was kind of, we're just historians. There was this big, broader team that we're representing. And then the broader search team and the broader engineering teams at Mercari really helped to make this what it is and to kind of get us to where we're going now. And so um, big thank you to them. And at the same time, because of that gratitude and wanting to give back, this is why we're hoping that this system is going to kind of really pay off dividends for the rest of Mercari going forward. Um, all teams, so not just AI and search, AI across the company, so now people can iterate really quickly on whatever you know, business problems they have at the time to deliver these real value to customers in a way that we know is going to work. It's been proven literally at our scale with our infrastructure and constraints. And so um, we tur it turned out, Riley, a lot better than we expected. And again, summing up that starting simple but starting now, I think, is really the key to um, a system like this and getting constant feedback, getting your head out of the sand every so often to kind of talk with other people and see how your system really fits their needs, getting that implicit buy-in, because now they want to use the system because it's not our system, it's their system now, right? And then building that piece by piece in response to these actual problems, I think that people will really see the PMs, you know, the C-levels included, will see, oh yeah, no, because you've been talking about us, because we've been working together on this, we do see the business impact, and we do support you, you know, going all in on this new crazy platform that you, uh, again, you're convincing us is going to solve all of our problems. And um, yeah, that's really it. So I think, again, uh, sorry to disappoint everybody, nothing really complicated, nothing complex here, but maybe hopefully that is the takeaway, is it doesn't need to be, right? You can be Japan's largest C2C e-commerce platform and you know, stick to something from a Medium article. 
and then still you know, deliver value to your customers. Um, so thank you for your time, and we welcome any questions you have. Thanks, Rob. Thanks very much, guys. I think uh, this was a really insightful talk. For me as a community manager, I also really like that you mentioned the whole team building aspect, yeah. you know, and I thought it was a really nice balance between uh, technology and, uh, and humans. I'm yeah. also really happy to uh, report that we do have a few online questions, so uh, keep these questions just for a second. So we have uh, somebody asking, how many people are on your search teams and how are they organized? <laughs> uh, many dozens of people on our teams. Um, I think, yeah, dozens is about right, the order of magnitude. Mm, yes. And yeah, the ML itself in the neighborhood of 10. Yes, exactly. And that's just in search because we do have ML teams distributed across Mercari as well. Cool, cool. So um, another question online is uh, regarding degrad degradation would cost a lot of money. Yes. Which strategies did you use to contain the risks and collateral damage while keeping up a high pace? Mm -hmm. So that's a good question. Yeah, that is a good question. Um, so I think um, the best way to say was the graceful degradation that we introduced with each component. So again, in the very worst case, we can say that it's no, no worse than Elasticsearch, but then you look at the business metrics and say, yeah, but there's a huge delta, right, between Elasticsearch and what you delivered. Sure, but at the same time, that's why we have this graceful degradation. So we tried to go 100% re-ranking coverage, no skips. That required a lot of infra, a lot of changes, but at least at the very if something did degrade, it would degrade to the next tier, right? So now, not 100%, we're at 70. Now not at 70, we're at 50. Now not at 50, we're 30. And at the same time, that gives us enough headway to say, okay, we need to fix this problem. We have our alerts going off. We're triaging, we're going um, kind of across teams to solve the problem. And so that gives us enough headway to bring it back to 100%. And if I could maybe add please. to that. Of course, uh, yeah. When we had a new feature to roll out, we also ramped up traffic gradually while keeping yeah, yeah. an eye on uh, business metrics and we put guardrails in place. So we would start at 5% of traffic and ramp it up gradually. And if we saw a big drop off right away, uh, we would uh, cut the experiment short. Awesome. Sounds like you really thought about this thing very well. OK. Yeah, thank you for the great talk. I really liked, like the iterative approach. Um, one thing I would be really interested in is like the implication for your A-B testing strategy. So. Mm -hmm. From where did you go to like which frequency of being able to run A-B testing? And then since you were using Selden Core, did you make any use of like alternative approaches like bandits, for example? Ooh, that's a good question. So I think at best two to three A-B tests a quarter, but it would take at least one or two engineers time, full time to even set up an A-B test, not even work on the feature itself or test anything else out. Um, and I think now we can do I mean, in theory, if we had a free A-B test schedule, dozens per quarter, right? Yeah, if we our, wanted to. Our only limitation now is how many models our ML engineers can create. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Exactly. I think, yeah, so, our, we, so for the business, we have like certain um, schedule of who can run an A-B test. So there's that. And then the bigger bottleneck is just this whatever two-week slot we have. So I think, yeah, uh, at this point, it's like an organizational bottleneck as opposed to technical. So. Right. So I think we actually have one question. So there are so many people who want to ask a question. <laughs> who do I pick? Who do I pick? Well, Joe, Joe, Joe. I think it's the, <laughs> it's the last question we can do. Thank you for a very inspiring talk. Um, you might cover this, but what is the re-ranking depth when you're getting the results from Elasticsearch? Like how many results Ooh. are you actually re-ranking? And can you say something about the correlation between the re-ranker and the actual first stage retriever? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So for the first part of how many, um, should we speak in orders of magnitude or should we? Sure. No. No? Oh. Oh, it's fine. It's fine. Our okay. boss says it's fine. So. Okay. Yeah. So I think, yeah, 120 search results, unfortunately. So that's one page of Elasticsearch results, which actually corresponds to 10 page scrolls on the app. So it kind of, it seems sensical from that point of view, but um, I will say we want to uh, definitely expand that candidate set much more in the future. Um, and then I guess for the second question, it was uh, the, was it the correlation between the first stage and second stage? Um, and so um, maybe I'm not understanding the question completely. The only correlation was actually um, indirect, well, direct, the only direct correlation was the fact that the model used Elasticsearch rank period. So we would see 
Um, this was zero in the search results, this was five, yada, yada. Um, but that was the only actual direct correlation in Elasticsearch. But, um, but yeah, the, yeah. Uh, the using the, the search results from Elasticsearch was a, a big problem in our opinion because they have a certain uh, mm -hmm. bias for how they return results and they're going to miss long tail, which is like kind of the power of machine learning. Uh, but the 120 limit is very strongly ingrained in Mercari yes. culture, so it might take some more convincing to grab more results. Yes.